All right. Well, we're going to get an outline up here on the uh, the screen for you, so you can follow along. And uh, I hope that uh, this will be helpful to you. Can you see it? Good. Okay. So we want to begin with the background of Roman Catholicism. I'm going to call it RC just for short, all right? Not the cola, but uh, if you're from down south, Royal Crown Cola, RC, right? This is Roman Catholicism, okay, RC. But before we actually get into the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church, let's talk a moment about the church in general. The Bible speaks about two phases of what is called the church. There is, first of all, what theologians call the universal church. Now, what does that mean? Well, here's what it means. We are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11 that the church, meaning the whole body of believers worldwide and also throughout church history, that the church is built on one foundation, and that one foundation is? It's Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ, right? And we are also told that it is built upon the apostles. They are the ones that laid Jesus as the foundation or the cornerstone. We are told in Ephesians, I think it's chapter 2 and verse 20. And in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse uh, 23, here is a reference to this universal church, if I can use that term. It's uh, the writer of Hebrews says, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Again, that is a reference to the church that has and does include all true born-again believers. When you become saved, when you are born again, the Holy Spirit of God immerses you, baptizes you into the body, the spiritual, the mystical body of Jesus Christ. Correct? You understand that? That makes you, as a member of his body, a member of this massive universal church, what he calls here the church of the firstborn, okay, who is Jesus. However, the New Testament, more often than not, when it uses the word church, the New Testament usually is, re is referring to a local congregation of believers, for example, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and we have the first and second letter to the Corinthians. Paul writes to the church that is geographically located in the city of Ephesus in his day. And so we have the letter to the Ephesians and so forth. And so there is this universal church that is mentioned in the Bible, but more often than not, when the word church is used, it's referring to local geographic congregations like Bethel Baptist Fellowship here in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn. We're a church. We're a local, visible assembly of the body of Christ, okay? That's how the word is used in the Bible. And I would also hasten to say this, that since uh, New Testament times, there have always been believers who have uh, practiced their Christianity based on Bible truth, who have always, since, uh, since the church was founded in the first century, there have always been believers who have believed the gospel, who have believed the word of God, and who have based their practice on the New Testament. For the first three centuries of church history, believers were 
virtually faithful to totally believe the Bible. But a key date in 324 AD, see that up there in your notes, in 324 AD, a Roman emperor by the name of Constantine decreed that Christianity would become the state religion, it would become the religion of the Roman Empire. He made it Rome's official religion. And there's some history that goes with that. Supposedly he had a dream and uh, he was told in the dream to go forth and conquer in the sign of the cross. And so this is where this comes from, that he decrees Christianity, which up until then was greatly persecuted and, uh, and now becomes accepted in the Roman Empire. Well, when that happened in 324 AD, what that actually accomplished was it brought together a marriage between the church and the government. You had a church, uh, a, a uh, state-run church. You had a wedding of church and state. And of course, as a result of simply by a emperor or a king's decree saying, we're all Christians now, and you all have to be baptized into uh, the church, what happens is you have thousands of pagans that are going to join the church because they're going to get personal advantages out of it. It's going to be to their benefit to join the church rather than not join. And so you have at this point a massive, I mean a massive introduction of paganism and all the rituals that went along with it into the churches of the Roman Empire until they gradually became predominantly pagan substituting pagan human traditions for biblical truth. Now, uh, you probably were given a sheet of paper, is that not so? If you didn't get the sheet of paper and would like it, uh, just slip your hand up and one of the ushers will see that you get it. But on this sheet of paper, I have uh, listed inventions by the Roman Catholic Church. By that I mean the traditions that were added, and many of them, uh, in fact, probably most of them, are of pagan origin. For instance, the first one, prayers for the dead. Prayers for the dead. Nowhere in the Bible do you find prayers for the dead. Nowhere are believers taught to pray for dead people. You know why? Why would that be? Because, yes, after death comes what? The judgment. And their, their state is eternally fixed. Okay? So it makes no sense biblically to pray for the dead. That is a human tradition. Here's another one. I think it's number nine. The doctrine of purgatory established by a pope, Gregory I. And uh, those of you that are Catholics perhaps know what purgatory is about. It comes from the Latin word that means to cleanse or to purge. Because the Roman Catholic Church teaches that after death, if you are not guilty of mere mortal sins, you can have your sins atoned for in a place called purgatory. Again, not in the Bible. They, they get it from an apocryphal book that they add to the Holy Scripture. And uh, as a result, you have people that believe that they're going to have a second chance for heaven if they spend however long they do in purgatory. To me, um, that's not a whole lot of hope. Uh, that's not very encouraging uh, to me, and I'm glad that it's a, it's a man-made tradition and it's not true. Uh, there's other things. Uh, prayers directed to Mary. Prayers directed to the saints. 
prayers directed to angels, all of that is man-made tradition, and it was paganism that was wedded to Bible truth that came into the Roman Catholic Church when Constantine declared uh, the empire Christian, quote-unquote. Now, these conditions, this pagan tradition continued for approximately a thousand years then into what is called the Middle Ages. Another term for the Middle Ages is the what? The Dark Ages. And the reason the Middle Ages are sometimes termed the Dark Ages is because during that 1,000 years and peaking in the Middle Ages, <clears throat> the Roman Catholic Church became more and more powerful, and the more power that they gained, the more tyrannical they became. And uh, as a result of that, they would not allow people to have a copy of the scriptures. And so ignorance of the scriptures settled in among the population as well, much pagan superstition. And so you have ignorance and, and superstition all gathering together and crescendoing in what is called the Dark Ages, and that's why it's dark. <laughs> And it led to an age of enlightenment, which, you know, was good and, and was not good in some other ways. But uh, this, is, this is what has happened. In the, the uh, 1500s, approximately, it actually started before this. But um, in those Middle Ages, just let me, let me say that. In the Middle Ages, monks from the Eastern Empire were fleeing the Islamic uh, invasion of their countries and of their lands. And when they fled, they brought manuscripts from their monasteries with them, biblical manuscripts. And when those manuscripts came to the West, biblical scholars uh, were then enabled to read the Bible that had been hidden from them for many, many years. And as a result, they began to see in reading these manuscripts that these Eastern monks brought to the West that the church had widely departed from the Bible. They began to see the glaring discrepancies. Uh, it enabled them to see how far the Roman Catholic Church had departed from Scripture. Some of these scholars began to seek change and they were called reformers and as a result of that they what's the word started or they launched perhaps I should say what is known in church history as the reformation the reformation roughly in the 1500s reformers like Martin Luther John Calvin, John Knox, uh, Zwingli. These men started, if we could call it this, a back to the Bible movement. They started a back to the Bible movement and they, they protested against the false doctrines and the false practices that they found in their own Catholic Church that uh, contradicted the New Testament. And because they protested that falsehood, they were termed protestants. 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 <laughs> okay? The reformers were really the first protestants uh, of their day. And uh, they demanded that the church return back to the purity and the simplicity of the New Testament. Well, that did not sit well with the Roman Catholic Church that had grown so large, that had become so powerful, that had become so tyrannical, that they countered with a counter-reformation. The Roman Catholics had a counter-reformation to try to overcome, oppose and overcome the Reformation, and so the church produced decrees or edicts. They held councils, uh, worldwide councils, in order to uh, put down this 
Reformation, but the biggest tool that they used is what is called the Inquisition. Are any of you familiar with the Inquisition? The Inquis Inquisition was uh, specifically uh, based in Spain. And the, the Inquisition was to hunt down and to torture and to kill what the Roman Catholic Church called heretics. Anyone that uh, protested really against their teaching their belief and their practices. And it was uh, uh, King Ferdinand and, and Queen Isabella that were specifically the, it, in control in Spain that were uh, the instigators of this Roman Catholic uh, Inquisition in cahoots with the Pope of Rome, Rome's counter-revolution. By the way, I should say, if you haven't, you should look up the uh, film called Flame in the Wind. Flame in the Wind. It's a wonderful uh, glimpse of, of the true Bible believers in the days of the Inquisition and how the church persecuted them, tortured them, burned them at the stake. That was the main way in which they killed the heretics. They would tie them to a stake put all kinds of straw and sticks around the bottom and light it on fire and they would burn them to death. Sometimes they would be gracious and they would strangle them first and then burn their bodies. But most of the time they just burned them alive. Didn't they kill Jews? Jews too. They did, they did also. Yes, that's true. That's true. Their, but their main focus were the heretics within their own church that disagreed with them. But yes, they did. In fact, uh, you understand that it was Ferdinand and Isabella that, uh, that kicked the Jews out of Spain. And uh, it's, uh, it's historically known that the money that was used to finance Columbus's discovery of the New World was the money that was uh, confiscated from the, the Jews that were whose property was confiscated and who were, who were uh, uh, exiled from the, uh, the country of Spain. Now, let's look at the second heading from the background to the beliefs. And I just want to talk uh, briefly with you about the, the authority. But uh, begin by talking about the name, Roman Catholicism or Roman Catholic. Now, don't be, um, don't be fooled by the name Catholic. The word Catholic means universal. It's a, uh, it comes from a Latin word that means universal. And uh, when you think of it, the universal church that I started out with telling you about that is mentioned in the scripture a few times is the Catholic church in, in that sense in that it is universal. All believers, part of the, the church of the firstborn, would make up the Catholic church when you define it as the universal church. Am I confusing you? Do you understand what I'm saying? You get that? Yes. You don't get that, okay. The word Catholic was taken by the Roman Catholic church and applied to them but it does not really mean what they say it means. It means universal. In, in other words, it applies to all believers and not just to them. In fact, Roman Catholicism or Roman Catholic is a contradiction of terms. Here's why. As I said, the word Catholic means universal, but the word Roman is a specific and so it's like an, an oxymoron. It, it doesn't apply. It doesn't work. You can't take something that is general and then make it specific. It's a contradiction of terms. Roman Catholic or Roman Catholicism. And uh, so they have chosen that term Catholic because 
they want to build themselves as the one and only true church. That's why they've taken that term that means universal and applied it to themselves. They want to see themselves as the one true church with exclusive rights and ability alone to interpret the Bible for everyone else and to determine how everyone finds justification from their sins. Basically, the Roman Catholic Church takes this authority to themselves, usurps this authority to themselves, and basically says, no one can properly understand the Bible and get to heaven outside of the Roman Catholic Church. That's how exclusive they are. In fact, I remember uh, Roman Catholic people that have been born again have told me on various occasions, Pastor, you know what? When we were children, uh, growing up in a Roman Catholic household and, and, uh, and active in the Roman Catholic Church, we used to pity poor Protestant children because we knew they didn't have a chance because they were outside of the church. And so this is the mentality. Now understand the authority of the Roman Catholic Church really is determined by the geographical location that they are in. In the United States of America, at least up to this time, they've had the limited ability to uh, take over people's lives. But you go to third world countries, for example, where Roman Catholicism is the leading religion, and I'm telling you, they rule the roost. They tell people what they can and cannot do, and people live under the fear of the thumb of the Roman Catholic Church in countries like that. This is the kind of authority that when they are able to, they wield, and they use to their own advantage. Now you should also know that the authority of the Roman Catholic Church is built on three pillars. What is the authority of the New Testament Church of the Lord Jesus Christ built on? The Word of God, right? The Bible is our only, our sole authority for what we believe and how we practice or live out what we believe. Amen. Not so with the Roman Catholic Church. Amen. They say they believe the Bible, but their Bible is very different from ours in, in a couple of ways. Number one, I'm not positive about this, but I'm wondering how many Roman Catholic Bibles are available without the, 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 uh, the notes at the bottom that uh, define for you in, or interpret for you what the Bible means in that particular section. Because remember, they don't trust you to interpret the Bible correctly yourself. So they make sure that the Bibles that they produce have these footnotes that help you to understand their interpretation of the Bible. Secondly, you should also note that a Roman Catholic Bible does not just have the 66 books of Scripture that we have. How many Old Testament chapters, or books rather, do we have in our, in our Bible? 39. How many New Testament? 27. For a total of? 66. The Roman Catholic Church has an additional section to their Bible called the Apocrypha. And the word apocrypha is a word that means hidden books. And most of these apocryphal books, of course they are not on the par with the Bible, with other scripture. But they are books, most of them written by uh, Jewish uh, uh, people. Um, and uh, they have some historical significance to them. But uh, they are not the Bible. And so you have to understand that when you pick up a Roman Catholic Bible, you're getting more than you bargained for. <laughs> you're getting more than the 66 books of Scripture. You're getting these other books that are put on the same par, on the same level with the Bible, and they're not. 
at best, the apocryphal books give some historical, uh, uh, some historical reference, but they are not scripture. Never intended to be, never claimed to be, but the Roman Catholic Church at a particular church council that it held declared that to be part of scripture. So, first of all, they say we believe the Bible, but that's not really uh, the case because it's a scripture that has been, uh, it, it's been messed with, right? It's a scripture that has been changed. Secondly, their second area of, uh, of authority is what is called the magistrarium. Is that up there? The magistrarium. Yeah, right here. See that word? And the magistrarium is really the official teaching body of the Roman Catholic Church. It's made up of cardinals and, uh, and uh, Roman Catholic theologians. Uh, who's the, the cardinal that hails here from New York City? Dolan. Yeah, Cardinal Timothy Dolan. He, he is part of this magisterium because he's part of the College uh, of Cardinals. And so the magisterium is made up of uh, these cardinals, these theologians, and they're all under the head honcho who is the, the papa, the pope, okay? That's the magisterium. And what the magisterium does is they deal with contemporary issues as they arise. Um, and uh, they give rulings on that. So that is another pillar. It's a three-legged stool, actually. There is what they call the Bible, and then the magisterium. But the third, and, and uh, probably even more uh, uh, important than the Bible, is the authority of tradition. Human tradition, Roman Catholic tradition. So... Those three make up the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. With their tradition, you have, again, that list that I, that I gave you, uh, all these different traditions that have come into the church over the period of, uh, you know, uh, a long time, hundreds and hundreds, a thousand years of tradition that have built up uh, that the church follows, rituals, um, uh, images, uh, venerating the saints, uh, uh, just to, to name a, a few of them. Okay. Any questions at this point? So the three pillars of authority that the church has built on, that three-legged stool, if I could put it that way, uh, the Bible, the magisterium, and tradition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in other words, uh, the Catholic Church has hijacked that, uh, that other universal, whatever you call it, they hijack that word and use it for their own purpose. Well, that's, that's the one way of putting it, I guess, that the Roman Catholic Church have, has taken the word Catholic and uh, made it to, to apply only to them. They are the universal church, and there is none outside of them, they would say. So, yeah, I guess you could uh, use the word hijacked. Yes, Liz? Didn't they make every effort to prevent people from reading scripture? They did. They did. They, they're not able to do so now uh, as much. Since Vatican II that took place in 1964-1965, they, they outwardly, they make some outward changes, they make some cosmetic changes, but the, the real heart of the Roman Catholic Church never has changed. But they, they, it appears as if they give people greater flexibility to read the scripture, but at the same time, they, they urge that that scripture is interpreted by the priest. Uh, it's interpreted by the church and not by you as an individual, even though you may have your own copy. When did they, uh, when was the first uh, Roman Catholic Church, if you know? When did it develop? 324 A.D. 324. That is that that is the starting point when Constantine declared Christianity the state religion, the religion of the empire. So okay, so it's developed all there. There was no Roman Catholic Church prior to that. So before that time, was the church the original churches from uh, from Jesus' death 
where they drew it to the word. And they took it on and they uh, pretty much yeah the word. pretty much obviously there has the always been there's always been veering off from the truth there's always been heresies there's always been uh, false teachers I mean you read your New Testament and false teachers are being spoken of by name and dealt with in the New Testament. So there's always been a veering off that has that have uh, caused factions, you know, of false teaching that uh, men that have had followings. But for the most part, the, the church was pure until it became wedded with the state like this, yeah. So if a Catholic person asks a Christian person, is, is my religion, is my Catholic faith, um, a real religion, like how would you answer that? I mean, it's a direct question. I would say it is a real religion. Right. It is a real religion. There's no uh, denying that. The, the question is not, is it a, a real religion, but is it a false religion? Is that what you mean? Yes. Oh. I think that was the question. Yeah. And I answered well, I mean, that's a difficult that's question to be to be put to you. Yes. Uh, but, you know, I would simply, uh, again, you can handle it different ways, but I would simply say, well, you know, what, what makes you ask that question? Why would you ask that? And uh, compare the New Testament with perhaps what they say. And I think the key thing that you need to center in on is salvation. And we'll talk about that now because uh, we're in the dogma section. If you'll move to the next uh, page, next section. The dogma section. And so in dogma, we talk about salvation. This is one of the greatest differences between what the New Testament teaches, what we believe, and what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that salvation is a process that is dependent upon grace, but they don't define grace the way that the New Testament defines grace. They say salvation is dependent upon grace, but that it is gotten through participation in the sacraments of the church, and that, uh, that it has to be earned, okay? Now, there are, there are seven sacraments that the Roman Catholic Church uh, follows that teaches that this is the pathway to salvation. Uh, one of which, of course, is infant baptism. Another one is following infant baptism at about 10 to 12 years of age, confirmation. And then uh, participating in the Eucharist, which is really the center of the Mass and uh, what you need to understand about that is when they celebrate the Mass and when they uh, celebrate the Eucharist, which is what we call communion or what we call the Lord's Supper, they have a definitely false teaching regarding the Lord's Supper. What they teach is when the priest gives his blessing over the host, that wafer, and over the cup, the wine, that that priestly blessing, listen to me, literally turns that wafer into the body of Christ and that wine into the literal blood of Christ. Which means that if you partake, if that's true and you partake of it, you're practicing cannibalism, really, when you think about it. You're eating human flesh and you're drinking human blood. That's not only gross, that is the height of blasphemy and, uh, and heresy. And so that's, uh, but that's part of the sacraments. That's part of being saved. That's how you get saved. You gotta participate in these sacraments as much as possible. Another sacrament is doing penance. And the way that penance is, uh, has been done for many years is by you going to confession every week and confessing to a priest your sin. Now they're not as big on that as they used to be, but uh, you remember when you go to confession, 
when you tell the, the priest uh, your sins that he tells you what you have to do to atone for that sin yourself. Uh, it might be you have to say, you know, ten Hail Marys or, or, or uh, you know, five Our Fathers or whatever. Certain prayers that you've got to pray for certain sins and a certain number of them, okay? That's penance. Certain things that you have to do, you have to uh, discipline yourself, you have to uh, punish yourself. In fact, that's what uh, is going on in the Philippines during the, uh, the, uh, the Easter celebration or prior to Easter when they flagellate themselves, you know, and they get themselves actually hung on, on, a, on a wooden cross. Uh, they're, they're doing penance that way. They're trying to gain points uh, for forgiveness of sins. It's, it's human works. There is another sacrament called extreme unction, and it is the anointing of a person's body on their deathbed that supposedly, if it's done by the priest, will uh, absolve them of sin and will at least get them into purgatory, uh, hopefully heaven. There is also uh, the ordinance of marriage. That's one of the seven sacraments. Of course, we know how that's been abused, uh, especially in modern times. Um, and then um, ordination is another of the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. But all of this to say, they are not depending upon the free grace. They're not depending upon the unmerited favor of God. They're not depending upon a free gift that we call salvation, but something that you have to do certain things in order to earn it. And the fact of the matter is, that really is the dividing line between what the Bible says and all other false religions teach. How does a person get right with God? How does a person uh, have a, a home in heaven? How does a person have their sin forgiven? Religion says, do. And uh, Muslims have their list of do's. And the Roman Catholics have their list of do's. And all other religions have their do list. We don't have a list because the list has already been completed, not by us, but by Jesus. And uh, someone has said, all false religion is two letters short. They say do, but Jesus says done. It's done, it's finished. And so this is the, the, the big difference when it comes to salvation. And uh, let's talk about uh, another part of the dogma, the priesthood. The priesthood is said to have the ability to either forgive sin or to withhold the forgiveness of sin uh, from you. In other words, when Jesus said to Peter, and by the way, they say in Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus said to Peter, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, that, that he was referring to Peter as the rock upon which he would build his church. Of course, we don't believe that the rock was Peter, but the rock was Peter's confession. Thou art the Messiah, the son of the living God. Well, they say that Peter was the first pope and that he passes down that succession of power and authority to the next pope and they pass it down to the next pope and so on. And here we are, you know, in uh, 2021, with Pope Francis over us, and they say that, or, or, or over the church, and they say that that succession of Pope Francis goes all the way back to Peter and Matthew chapter 16. Well, priestly power to forgive sin is based also on that Matthew 16 and Matthew 18 passage where Jesus says to his disciples, uh, if what you bind will be bound in heaven, what you loose will be loosed in heaven, which they interpret as the ability to either forgive or withhold forgiveness of sin from people. But that is not what Jesus meant. I'm not gonna go into that today, but uh, in other words, the priest, he has the, he has the lifeline to heaven. You don't. The priest has a vertical, lifeline to heaven 
and, uh, and all the rest of us are just peons, you know. And uh, we have no hope but through the priest, through his life. If he throws us a lifeline because he has that vertical relationship, the rest of us are all in a horizontal relationship. And so this priesthood and its ability to bind or loose, to forgive or not forgive uh, through uh, penance or confession or the Eucharist at Mass is really, it, it, it holds power over an individual. I'm thankful that when the New Testament talks about priests, it says you're a priest, male or female. If you're a believer, you are a priest. And, and so the New Testament teaches the priesthood of all true believers in Jesus and not some uh, clerical class uh, that is above the, the laity. Okay? It's a power grab is really what it's about. It's a way to keep people in bondage. In fact, the church has said on more than one occasion, you give me a child from birth and... Uh, will keep them for life. How many times have you heard the Catholics say, look, I was born a Catholic, I'll die a Catholic. Of course, Jewish people and other people say that too. But I mean, that's, that, that's what they want. That's what they teach. That's what they're shooting for. Another and the final thing I'm going to mention today is uh, the veneration uh, that the church teaches. The veneration of angels, images, statues, uh, saints, of course, probably more than any, Mary herself. And they divide it up into different uh, degrees of, of, of venerating them. Latria, Dulia, Hyperdulia. Hyperdulia is the highest form of veneration, and that is reserved for Mary. You're to pray through these angels. You're to pray through these saints. You're to pray to God through Mary. They say that uh, uh, they use uh, well, just uh, human logic. For example, you know, when you were a child, uh, if you wanted something really badly, you probably didn't go to your dad because he was more hard-nosed than your mom. So you would go to your mother because she's more soft and tender and compassionate, and you would, you would ask her in a nice way, and you would then get what you want through your mother. She would go to dad and get him to approve. Well, that's the, that's the priestly logic that is used in praying to Mary. You don't go to God directly uh, or even Jesus you go through Mary, and Mary, she's the mother of Jesus, and so she's able to soften him, soften him up and get from him what you need. That's the logic, and that's what uh, they teach regarding praying uh, through Mary or the saints. But Mary is called the mother of God. Is she the mother of God? Does God have a mother? I don't think so. She's the mother of the human Jesus, but she's not the mother of his deity. That's different. He was 100% God and 100% man. And she is the mother of his humanity, in a sense, because she carried him in her womb and gave him birth, but the seed was planted by the Holy Spirit of God in her womb. She's called the mother of angels. In fact, she's called the mother of the Roman Catholic Church. One of her, the favorite terms that the church has for Mary is the queen of heaven. If you go back in the prophets, you'll find in Jeremiah that the idolatrous Israelites were praying to a false god called the queen of heaven. Roman Catholicism, and I'm not going to trace it back for you, but the roots of it can go all the way back to the Tower of Babel. There's books that's been written on this. The Babylonian mystery religion and how it has developed through the millennia. And I would also say this, and this is really blasphemous, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that Mary 
is a co-mediator. There is one mediator between man and God, right? Who is it? But the Roman Catholic Church teaches that Mary is a co-mediator with Jesus to God, the Father. Not only that, the blaspheme, uh, the blasphemy goes even deeper. The church teaches that Mary is a co-redemptrix, which means when Jesus died on that cross to provide redemption for us, that she suffered redemption for us vicariously through her son, and it's through her redemption as well as his that we can hope to earn our salvation. That's pretty serious stuff. Now, that's all I'm going to say in part one, other than to close with this thought. I'm not telling you this so that you get angry with Roman Catholics. You need to love them. The only way you'll ever bring anyone out of darkness into the light is by loving them to life. Loving them to life in Jesus. He is the life. And so, don't start arguments with them. That you have this head knowledge, that's not going to help you to win them to Jesus. You just need to show them the scripture. I wanted you to know what they believe, but you need to show them the scripture. You need to show them, and I start with them often uh, in this way. Did you know, uh, well, or how do you know, do you know that you have eternal life? Are you 100% sure? Are you 100% are you sure that when you die, let's say five years from now, you're going to be in heaven? Oh, no one can know that. Can I show you in the Bible where it says you can know? 1 John 5.13 These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That's how I begin it with uh, Roman Catholic people. But anyway, that's just a little bit of uh, a part of what I wanted to share with you. We'll, we'll pick it up uh, next week. And is there any questions before we close in prayer, Liz? How old were you? I was like seventh grade, whatever. Every so about twelve. She never answered. Great question. I it, it was honest because I didn't realize I had read more. Oh, okay. She told us to. Okay. And she said, in nineteen sixty five, I think it was. I did not tell you to read that section of the Bible. Hmm. Interesting. It's interesting, isn't it? But uh, good question. That's great. Well, yes. Do they still practice indulgences? Is that related to the priests forgiving, being able to forgive sins? Yeah. Forgive yeah. The they do, but not in the same way they did when, when Tetzel was selling them. Okay? They, they do still practice indulgences because uh, you can hire a priest to pray for your dead relative. And, uh, and that really is, in in way, that's, that's getting them out of purgatory. Yeah. Uh, Well, this is it. Uh, I think that there really are only two reasons for true born-again people to remain in the Roman Catholic Church. Number one, 
They're ignorant. They don't know the scriptures. When they learn the scriptures, they're going to see that it's totally different from what the church teaches. And secondly, they know, but they're unwilling to pay the price, you know, maybe to be disowned by their family or whatever it might be. And that's true in other religions, too. That's true in Judaism because, you know, the real Orthodox, they will disown you and, and have a funeral for you if you uh, turn to Jesus as the Messiah. So it's either ignorance or just uh, unwillingness. The what? That practice Lent. 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 Oh, uh-huh. Uh-huh, yeah. Well, I don't see that in the Bible. And that comes out of Roman Catholicism. If you look at the list, you'll find that that's on the list of human traditions, okay? What you have to understand is Protestantism was, comes out of Roman Catholicism. And uh, they said a lot of right things. They did a lot of right things, but they didn't come far enough in some ways. And I think observing the Lenten calendar, for example, is uh, one way in which they have not totally broken with Rome. Because the whole idea of Lent is a works-based salvation. And so I would not practice it. I would not teach it. Yeah. I was say, they don't seem to, they don't teach you very much. It's all uh, liturgy, mainly liturgy. Well, they Only teach you they Only teach you their you liturgy. No. Yeah. Only what you yeah. They want you to know. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Pastor. Yes. Well, the church uh, has only had two main councils in their history. The Council of Trent and then the Vatican Council uh, II that took place in the mid-60s. So uh, they, they have really not uh, revamped anything, just changed a little window dressing in Vatican II. Yeah. Well, the Pope can say anything he wants uh, because he is the final authority. He is the head of the magisterium, which is the main pillar of the Roman Catholic Church. However, there is a place for the Pope to not just give his opinion, but to give church law. And when the Pope sits in what they call the position of ex officio, that means that what he says is binding on all Catholics. So I think when, he, what, when he's saying things like, you know, approving of same-sex marriage or whatever, he's, he's voicing his opinion, and there's a lot of Catholics that disagree with him on that, but he's not speaking in that official position where you have to obey me or you're excommunicated. Yeah, <laughs> we need to pull the plug on this. Yeah. He's elected appointed, right? So where is his deity? Where is his, you know, he's, he's, he's man-made. Who are you to question? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you today for the opportunity that we've had to talk about this important subject. But Lord, we want to love Catholics. We want to reach them with the gospel. And although we may hate the system, I pray that we'd be able to uh, differentiate between the people and the system that they are so tragically caught up in. Lord, give us a love for these people as we would want to have a love for the Jewish people or the Muslim people. And give us a burden to reach them with the blessed gospel of the Lord Jesus. Lord, open, open eyes and remove that blindness and give us the power of the Holy Spirit as your witnesses that we would depend upon you 
to see souls brought out of darkness like this into the blessed light of the glorious gospel of Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen.